I had an overall approach to the economy and the operation of the economy that was unique uh, uh, to Minsky himself. And unfortunately is largely unknown, not that the financial instability hypothesis is known everywhere, but the rest of his work is also largely unknown. And the idea is to try to put together a series of lectures picking up these particular points and hopefully by the end we'll be able to see that this does constitute a more or less coherent and compact approach to looking at the, uh, the operation of the system. So as Brandy pointed out yesterday, most, most people link Minsky to the bust. Uh, he was more interested in the boom, but it was not only the boom and the bust that he was interested in. He was interested in the overall operation of, uh, of the economic system, capitalist economic systems. So the presentation that I'm going to make this morning is to pick up one of those particular items, and that particular item is his work on uh, financial regulation, starting from the background idea that if we look at the way Minsky is, has been perceived recently, it's linked primarily to the idea of the financial crisis. Now, during the financial crisis, everybody rediscovered Minsky. Minsky, as you know, believed very much in economic cycles, and Minsky himself has been subject to an economic cycle. He gets rediscovered every time we have a crisis, and then he gets forgotten every time the crisis is eventually resolved. In this particular instance, the crisis produced, as it often has done, a pressure for re-regulation in the financial system. And one of the problems of this concentration of Minsky, or the concentration of public attention on Minsky as being part of the crisis, explaining the crisis, is that people completely forgot that most of Minsky's early work was in the area of financial regulation. That is, this is, in a sense, where he started out. As Randy pointed out yesterday, his early theoretical work was in the sort of ceilings and floors, cyclical movements. But if you have an economy that has ceilings and floors, and you want to do something about moving those ceilings and floors, as Randy said, first you have the problem of creating institutions that do that, but you also have the problem of creating regulations that allow you to do that. So this idea that uh, Minsky is linked primarily to the crisis, yes, it does work, but primarily all of his early work and his fundamental work, which led to the formulation of his approach to economic cycles, came in his work on financial regulation. Now, I just put up a list here of the, the works that we're talking about. And it's interesting to note that not only was High, as a young academic, published in the major journals, he was also consulted by the major financial regulators. So that one of the, well, I, th I would consider one of the most important original papers that he did, the financial crisis, financial systems, and performance of the economy, was published in a book of research studies that was commissioned by the Commission on Money and Credit. The Commission on Money and Credit was set up in the uh, aftermath of the return to more or less normal economic policy uh, in the United States. Those of you may be familiar with US economic history, there's the famous Fed Treasury Accord in uh, 1951, which tried to spell out the division of policy powers between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. And the Commission on Money and Credit was set up to try and define the ways in which the Federal Reserve should in fact, should in fact be operating. So that it would have seemed sensible to go back and look at some of this, some of this work. The second is a study that was done for the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve System, not one of the district banks, uh, called Financial Instability Revisited, the Economics of Disaster. Uh, and this was, again, something that was commissioned by a financial regulator, which I have a very basic uh, contribution. 
Then there's a series of papers in 75, 76, and this uh, suggestions for a cash flow oriented bank examination is a very practical, hands-on elaboration of the theories that I developed as a result of this work on regulation. And again, this is something which was presented, promoted in within the Federal Reserve. Unfortunately, it was never it was never adopted. But it is interesting that now, finally, some 30, 35 years later, much more attention is being given to this idea of looking at uh, what I call cash flow oriented bank examination. We'll see a little bit later exactly what that means. So these are the, I would say, the the crucial fundamental pieces that eventually led to the development of the financial instability hypothesis, which came, uh, which came somewhat, somewhat later. So if we look at Minsky's idea, his definitions of what he believed to be the traditional uh, approach to regulation, what we today would call the micro prudential approach. <laughs> the instability of banks and other financial institutions is usually described in terms of runs and defaults at particular institutions without a clear explanation of why such strong asset substitution quite suddenly becomes the rule of the day. When conceived in terms of bank runs and defaults, a particular bank fails because of its own idiosyncratic attributes. Its management has been incompetent or committed fraud. Okay, so he said basically what we're doing, we're saying the reason that we have difficulties in the system, it's the bad apples approach, and regulation is supposed to identify those bad apples. So you should look at single financial institutions by themselves. And if you think of the problems that we've had in the last crisis, one of the difficulties was that bank regulators looked at single institutions. We know that Lehman Brothers was considered to be adequately capitalized by its regulator. But it was quite clear that Lehman was not adequately capitalized because of its relationship to other, uh, other financial institutions. So Hai's basic approach from the 1970s was to look at the idea of interconnectedness or this idea of what we call now systemic stability or systemic instability. And I argue that if you're going to have a regulatory structure that gives you systemic stability, it requires systemic regulation. Now, this is what today we now call macro prudential regulation. Again, sort of rediscovering the wheel, and this is one of the reasons why I said it was quite unfortunate that Heiser really work wasn't uh, in regulation, wasn't taken into account. So, Minsky starts out by in uh, in the Commission of Money and Credit paper, regulation requires a more complete description of the instability of an economy with banking. Okay, what was one of the difficulties of the models that were used by virtually all of the central banks? They did not have banks as an integral part of those models. The financial sector simply was not there. So I starts out by arguing, if you're going to have a theory that underlies your approach to regulation, that theory has to have a role for banks. It needs to look behind the bank runs and analyze the structure of balance sheets, payment commitments, and position-making activities. Position-making for a bank consists of the transactions, borrowing, and sales of assets undertaken to bring the cash position to the level required by regulation or bank management. This is what I eventually called the position-making view of banking. Failures do not arise simply because of incompetent or corrupt management. They occur mainly because of the interdependence of payments commitments and position-making transactions across institutions and units. So we start out with this basic idea that banks are financial institutions that are set up in order to produce profits. They produce profits by, I would say, making position. Making position means what? Making position means lending okay, to the private sector, lending to firms. I would call this accepting the firm's liabilities, and then issuing their own liabilities. Okay, Issuing their own liabilities is what he calls making position. How do you fund those loans? And the problem of regulation is to look at the interconnection or the balance between the cash flows that are 
required as cash inflows and the cash outflows that are created by those positions. And this is, I say, where I starts with this original idea of focusing on cash inflows and cash outflows and focusing on balance sheets. And it starts by looking at banks, by looking at financial institutions. <laughs> So, if we look at the problem I sets out, the problem facing uh, bank regulators, is that the regulatory system has to serve two masters, and it cannot do this, I says, and the difficulty is trying to make them com compatible. One master re <coughs> requires assurance that the financing needed for capital development of the economy will be forthcoming. The other master requires assurance that a safe and secure payments mechanism will be provided is why do we have the financial system? Well, we have the financial system, one, to provide the payment system. You want that to be safe and secure, okay? You want to make sure that when you've got a bank deposit, your money will always be there. But at the same time, that bank deposit represents a position of the bank funding the private sector, and we want to fund the private sector in order that the private sector will be able to produce the capital development of the economy. Now, what does he mean by capital development? It's not just physical pieces of machinery. The capital development of the economy is the creation of employment, creation of demand, creation of expansion, and the creation of well-being. So, and at the center of the center of the system, the banks having to satisfy these two particular functions. It needs to be understood now that development financing involves taking risks, okay? That idea of producing the capital development is not a riskless activity. That projects would not perform up to the expectations of their promoters and financiers and opens the way for fraud and unsafe banking procedures. The need is for a regulatory and supervising authority for the financial system that accepts that financing development opens the system to losses that have the potential for adversely affecting the safety and security of the economy's payment facilities. Okay? The banks are lending money in risky activities. Those risky activities could go bad. The banks could make losses. And in fact, they're supposed to make losses. Okay? But at the same time, they're also supposed to provide a system of payments that never allows for losses. And this is the basic contradiction that I identifies behind financial regulation. The regulations have to attempt to meet those two masters, but in fact, they can never do so because those two aims will always be incompatible. So the regulatory problem is to allow for this possibility. The regulators need to try to insulate the payment system from the consequences of such losses. The problem, therefore, is to provide for protecting the payment system from the consequences of the losses which may ensue from development financing. So with this background, I says, how, do, how are we going to go about regulating the financial system? Well, he said, the first thing, obviously, is that we have to have a theory that allows for bank failure. We have to have a theory that allows for the fact that the financing of these risky activities Okay, will in fact produce losses. And those losses won't simply because, be because we have bad apple bankers, because we have bankers who are engaged in fraudulent activity. The risk characteristics of banking and the tasks of bank regulators are different in a world in which instability is a present danger than in a world in which markets are stable. If bank regulators are to do a better job than in the past, regulation needs to be based upon an understanding of how our financial structure becomes susceptible to financial crisis. Okay? Now, this is where High starts his criticism of mainstream, both Keynesian and neoclassical theory. Why? Because not only does it not have a role for banks, it does not have a role for crisis, for financial crisis. Okay? It is a theory of equilibrium. It is a theory of self-correcting or self-adjusting forces leading the system back to equilibrium. So I says that theory cannot provide a basis for regulation, because what is the need for regulation if you can never have a crisis? 
And in fact, if we look at what happened during the period of deregulation under President Reagan and, and uh, subsequent administrations, the idea was that deregulation would in fact produce stability because of the belief in the underlying economic model that would produce, basically produce, uh, produce equilibrium. So High sets himself as his goal the need to produce a theory in which financial crisis is a naturally occurring phenomenon. The fundamental question then facing regulators and the fundamental question in economic theory is whether the development of such crisis-prone situations are the result of correctable institutional flaws or are due to policy errors. A quite common interpretation is that events like our current crisis are due to errors of economic policy management rather than inherent characteristics of the economy. Now, in the last crisis, I unfortunately with did, so he's not talking about the last crisis. He's talking about the crisis in the 1960s. A common interpretation is that events like our current crisis are due to errors of economic policy management rather than inherent characteristics of the economy. This appears to be the same approach that is currently being applied, and this is me talking now. This appears to be the same approach that is currently being applied to reform of the US financial system, which was disturbed by an unpredictable 100 year or 500 year or black swan or whatever it happened to be. That is, it's something that <clears throat> is not a natural occurring phenomena, it's an exception. And it's, it's an idiosyncratic exception. I would say no. This is the wrong way to look at the regulation of the system. You have to have a theory in which normally crisis arises, and that would then allow you. So, if you look at High's work, then you can say this early work is on the one hand structural. Structural in what sense? Structural in the sense of looking at bank operations, looking at bank balance sheets. As uh, Randy mentioned yesterday. One thing that was crucial here was the work that he did both uh, in California and then subsequently at Washington University in St. Louis, where he was, in fact, on the board of a medium-sized Midwestern bank and took a very active role in looking at the way the bank operated in that area. So if we look at the development of that, that work, as we said, it was first structural and institutionally descriptive. We then find in the 1970s, and we can sort of make a break here. I mean, what Hyatt produced in these regulatory structures was an explanation of how crisis occurs. Okay, crisis occurs how? Well, we talked about it in terms of the economics of disaster, how you end up in positions in which banks have made commitments and have to finance those commitments, are unable to do so, when, what happens? When the private sector produces the losses that they will normally produce in the movement, the expansion of, of the economy. After that, he starts looking for a more, a firmer theoretical basis, and this comes out in the theory, I, what I call here the theory of cyclical behavior. Now, Randy mentioned yesterday this book, John Maynard Keynes. The book John Maynard Keynes basically was an attempt that High himself made to ground his theory of systemic crisis in Keynesian theory. So as Randy said yesterday, the book really is not that much about Keynes. It's very much about High looking at the theoretical requirements to found this idea of a, a model with a, systemic, with a systemic crisis. As we said, up until this point, there is no, uh, really no mention of this idea of the financial instability hypothesis and things of, of this sort. Uh, at the same time, subsequently, the Kolesky profit equation gets introduced. Gets introduced, why? Well, if you're thinking about not a single bank, but an economy with banks, and the bank is lending to the private sector, the ability of the private sector to meet the cash commitments to the banks depends on what? Well, it depends on the ability of these firms to earn a sufficient amount of profits in order to be able to repay the bank loans. 
So the stability in the system requires some explanation of where the profits come from. Model. Now somebody asked yesterday uh, the question of why Koleski was or was not uh, was not in the in the earlier book. This is, I think, something of a uh, something of a mystery because I was writing writing this book while or during a period in which he spent a sabbatical year in Cambridge. And in that year, he shared a room with Pier Angelo Garignani. And very frequently, Tom Rimes, who was a Canadian economist, had the room across the hall. And very frequently, there would be debates that broke out in the corridor between the, between the two rooms. And quite clearly, Koleski was present, not at that time physically, but shortly thereafter, he was physically present. His theory was certainly physically present. And I certainly was familiar with what at that time was called the post-Keynesian or the rising post-Keynesian theory of, uh, of economic growth and distribution. So he certainly was cognizant and he was aware of this. Now, my explanation of why it wasn't directly included in the book and in the theory at that time is that for those of you who are familiar with the Cambridge capital controversy and the Calder Robinson growth and distribution theories, all of these theories were based on a distinction between the short period and the long period. That is, Keynes was classified as being the short period of effective demand, and the problem of post-Keynesian theory was developing a long period theory of growth and distribution. That long period theory was a theory of stationary states, a theory of steady states. And High would have no truck whatsoever with steady states or stationary states. His entire theory was based on the development of endogenous forces creating a crisis. So that there was absolutely no possibility of melding these two theories together. And it is certainly the case that in this period you find High writing papers, and I think Randy mentioned this yesterday, High in the beginning refused to identify himself as a post-Keynesian. Why? Because at that time post-Keynesians meant that we were working on these no, rather tedious stationary state long period growth and distribution models, which I absolutely did not take into consideration. On the other hand, once he did recognize that the Koleski equation had the possibility, and Koleski certainly was not somebody that bought into these long period theories. If you, any of you know the work of Thomas Akopoulos uh, in the Koleskian line, very much the idea is that there is no such thing as the long period. The long period is what? The long period is just a succession of short period, uh, short period states. So the answer to that particular conundrum, I think, comes in terms of these, what were at that stage, two very different research objectives. And I certainly was unwilling to sign up to the, uh, to the post-Keynesian theories at that point. As I say, eventually he did take on the Koleski equation because it played a very crucial role in his explanation of endogenous crisis. And subsequently, we then get after the profit equation, High starts to develop this idea of the dual pricing equation, which he gets primarily from his reading of the, of the treatise, and also the fact that once you step into Koleski's world, you do have problems. Someone asked the question yesterday about uh, monopoly pricing, administrative pricing. You do have the question of how prices, in fact, get fixed. So there was sort of there's sorts of a logical uh, progression in terms of the way the theory gets built up. And it's at this stage that you start to find High talking about the financial instability hypothesis. And you get the formulation of the hedge speculative and Ponzi financing structures or financing strategies for, for firms. And then the last step that emerges is the, the idea is that it, be, it becomes not only a, a descriptive theory, and an institutionally descriptive theory of how banks operate, 
Faraday's function, but becomes a theory of how they change. And this is when the idea of uh, what Randy called the stages comes in. This is the Heinz 57 varieties of capitalism because high being an active participant in banking could see the way banks were changing the way they operated and if you have a theory in which banks are the central or the crucial point at which instability occurs and banks change those institutional practices for example, Randy mentioned yesterday the idea of securitization. I was one of the first economists to pick up on securitization. Okay? He saw quite clearly that this produced a change in the way banks made position. Okay? Remember banks, the position-making analysis of a bank? Securitization is a different way of making position. And obviously, this is going to have an impact on the way crisis is produced in the system. So for people who say, I don't know, this is one of the, the, the points that I disagree with Randy. He said, well, you know, the first hypothesis was all about financing investment. No, it, it really wasn't about that. It was about position making in general. It was about cash flows. It was about incomes, cash inflows, and cash outflows. And you can apply this to anything. That is, any unit in the financial system has these characteristics. And this is one was one of High's points that it was wasn't only the banks that were important. You also had to look at the balance sheets of the firms, and you also had to look at the balance sheets of households. And a little later on this week, I'm going to talk about international impacts of the theory, and there we're going to look at the balance sheets of countries in exactly the same way. So I would argue that the approach is absolutely general, it's just that the institutional characteristics change, and I was very much attuned to those changes in the institutional characteristics of how the, uh, how the financial system operates. So we get to this basic point is that the entire work that I produced was the idea that if you're going to have effective regulation, you have to have a theory in which financial instability is normal. Standard economic theory leads to the proposition that markets are equilibrating. It is evident that disequilibrating forces exist in the essential financing practices of a capitalist economy. These disequilibrating forces center in the financial in the financing of positions in capital assets and investment in progress. In time, financial practices lead to an environment in which financial crises can occur. And it really makes no difference whether this is financing of investment or financing of consumption or financing of anything else. The system is always creating liabilities in order to acquire assets. And if the system functions in that way, I argue that it will always lead to an environment in which uh, crises Occur. Now, one example of the application of this theory is the high position on deposit insurance. Okay? Now, most people believe that deposit insurance is an absolutely necessary uh, part of the financial system. High was a little bit more uh, nuanced in that approach. He said, whenever bank failures are due to idiosyncratic behavior, actuarial estimates of the probability of payoffs are possible. This is what we call the traditional micro-prudential approach. In such cases, the insurance model is applicable and the proposed reforms of the structure of deposit insurance could be beneficial. So, he's saying deposit insurance is what? It's based on sharing risks. Okay? And if you have a system in which those risks are simply generated by the behavior of individuals, then an insurance model works. Okay? As long as you have a pool of people with medical insurance, if only one person gets sick at a time, the system works very well. If everybody gets sick at the same time, then the insurance principle does not work. So if you have a view of the operation of the financial system, the view of crisis, we say it's all due to idiosyncratic fraudulent behavior, banking, deposit, insurance is a sensible approach. On the other hand, if you believe that crises do result from the systemic behavior of the banking system, then deposit insurance cannot help you. 
and this deposit insurance is not sufficient. So a system-wide decline in asset values cannot be contained by a guarantee or bailout of some restricted class of deposits or institutions. If instabilities that can generate large system-wide losses of output, employment, and asset values are to be contained, then more than deposit insurance is needed. That is, you need basically what today we would call this macroprudential approach. And what I argued was that it was necessary for the government quite simply to guarantee all deposits. It's not a question of guaranteeing you know, the first 50,000 or the first 100,000 or just deposits in regulated, uh, in regulated banks. So this is an example of how the approach the theoretical approach to financial crisis leads to a decision on regulatory practice. So if you believe in the traditional model, the traditional model says you're always going to go to equilibrium, every once in a while you get a bad banker, then insurance is something that provides stability. On the other hand, if you believe the system is subject to systemic crises, then deposit insurance really does you no good at all does not provide uh, stability. Basically, the concept of crisis that I had in his early work was something we, which we can call system-wide financial distress. And he defined this, again, in his work in the 1960s. Financial distress occurs when an individual financial institution cannot meet its obligations on its balance sheet liabilities. What does that mean? Well. Many of you may have heard of high talking about financial institutions having to sell position to make position. Okay, now this is a nice phrase and unfortunately people simply do not understand what it means. Okay, selling position to make position. In highest terms, remember that banks are position-making institutions. Position-making means that in order to hold a liability on your balance sheet, there is an asset that backs that liability. Now, if you have to sell, and the position-making is financing that asset on your balance sheet. So if you have to sell position to make position, it means that you have to sell something in order to finance something else that you have on your balance sheet. Okay, so this is the idea, selling position to make position. Now the difficulty with selling position to make position, as I said, this is financial distress. Financial distress means that you're not able to meet your commitments. The problem is, again, if a single institution faces these problems, it's not a problem for the stability of the financial system. On the other hand, if we recognize that a financial system that is selling position to make position, it means that this involves some other financial institution or some other sector of the economy. Okay, who are you selling that position to? What position are you making? And this then leads to the interconnectedness that may allow a system to evolve into what Kai calls a financial crisis which is when a very significant subset of the economy is in financial distress due to a slight disturbance in monetary flows which creates such widespread financial distress that financial crisis is threatened and the economy will then exhibit financial instability. Okay, so this is the first formulation of this idea of financial instability in the system. This idea that cash flows are insufficient Okay. in order to meet commitments. So in order to meet those commitments, you have to sell position. You have to start selling, uh, selling assets. The idea of starting to regulate a system which is subject to financial distress then comes to the idea of regulation that limits the dual vulnerability of position-making banks. The objective of regulation and examination is then to identify and limit, number one, position liquidity, which is funding the position, is how do you actually generate the funding for the assets that you're holding, and then market liquidity, that is whether or not the position can be sold. So if you believe that financial distress is created by having to sell position in order to make position, the first thing you have to do is to look at the liquidity of that 
position is am I being funded by deposits? Am I being funded by short-term uh, short borrowing? Am I being funded by long-term borrowing? And then the market liquidity of that position. Can I sell it quickly in order to put my balance sheet back in order? And Hyde calls this the dual vulnerability that emerges wherever distress is created by cash flows from operations failing to meet ongoing financial commitments. It's at this stage that we see the importance of what uh, High called financial layering. We now talk about uh, interconnectedness or the complexity of the financial system. And again, we're looking at uh, positions that High put forward in the 1960s. At each stage in the evolution towards financial instability, financial intermediaries become more reliant on other financial institutions such as banks to refinance their liabilities. Okay? Basically what he's saying is that if you have to sell position to make position, you're selling position to some other financial institution, and that other financial institution is then going to be having to finance that position, and you end up with what we call financial layering. Now, if we look at the run-up to the last financial crisis, what was the basic characteristic? The basic characteristic was that financial institutions were basically financing each other. So if we look at the uh, liabilities of financial institutions to the private sector and divide it into the private household sector and divide it into the financial system, we find that the largest proportion of the financial assets were financial assets that were being financed by other financial institutions. They weren't financing business, they were financing each other. Okay? And a key to the generation of financial crisis is whether the holders of marketable securities who have large-scale debts outstanding can refinance or must liquidate their positions when they need cash. And again, liquidating their position means selling position to make position. The worst thing that could happen to the solvency of any financial institution is a forced sale of its assets in order to acquire cash. Okay? Now, you'll note I talked about the liquidity of a position. The liquidity of a position is what? Well, cash is the most liquid position, and this is why we're always talking about the need to make position in terms of cash. Now, I did very much believe that the first line of stability in the financial system was, in fact, the banks. Okay? Why? Because the banks were always in a position to lend to the private sector in order to allow a private sector institution to fund itself. But, he then pointed out, in order to avoid a full-scale financial crisis, should commercial banks refuse indirect accommodation to money and capital market institutions, that is, if the banks who had access to the central bank refused to by position to allow some other institution to sell position, then access to the discount window of the central bank should be made direct. There is no reason why approved government bond dealers and approved finance houses should not have access to the Federal Reserve System now when no crisis threatens. Okay. Now, if we look at this, what Pai is basically saying is that not only should the Federal Reserve do what it did in the recent crisis, that is to allow virtually every institution borrow at the discount window by using the exceptional procedures under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, I said, this should not have been an exceptional procedure. It should have been a normal procedure. Why should it have been a normal procedure? He said, it should have been a normal procedure because that lending should have taken place before the crisis broke out. That is, that's how it prevents the crisis. So if you look at the operation of the Fed, we know that the Fed created these special lending facilities for special institutions. But it only did it after the institutions were technically insolvent. 
Okay, so what you were doing was bailing out insolvent institutions after the crisis had taken place. And I said, well, if you're going to do this, this is really a waste of time. If you want to support the system and the banks are unable to do it, you should do it before the crisis occurs. And as he said, the Federal Reserve should do this now, when major recommendations that he makes in the study, the Federal Reserve study on the reform of, uh, of the reform of the discount window. Now, I was going to skip the last two, the last two quotes, but I won't because of what Randy said yesterday about again this business of Hai being concentrating on, invest, on investment finance. This is in fact not true. Hai was always uh, very much focused on. We look at the last one. A number of these agencies center around the home mortgage market and the specialized home mortgage banks. Already in the 1960s, there were difficulties in the specialized financing of home mortgages at much of his early work, both at the Mark Twain Bank and in terms of these regulatory procedures, deals with the difficulties surrounding the financing of home mortgages. So it was, it's not only the problem of financing investment in capital equipment in firms, this is the problem of banks financing investment in, uh, in basically in real estate, which if you look at the history of the United States, virtually every crisis and virtually every business cycle has been linked somehow or other to financing mortgages and the residential, the residential construction in terms of creating in terms of creating demand. So I was very much attuned to, the, uh, to this particular problem. And certainly, had he lived through the last crisis, would have been one of the first uh, to point out the difficulties that were being created in terms of this type of lending. Um, yeah, and this is, well, I won't bother to read through this one. This is just Hive saying, again, that if you're going to have deposit insurance, then the deposit insurance also should be total. So if the Federal Reserve should provide discount facilities to all institutions in the system, then obviously, by the same token, if you're going to have deposit insurance, that deposit insurance should cover, uh, should cover the, uh, the entire system. So it says, a macro stability enhancing response to the problems of financial instability would be for the government to accept that it has an open-ended contingent liability to the deposits uh, of the financial system. This idea of lending before the crisis occurs, we can call anticipatory macro prudential, and here is high in the uh, more recent, uh, more recently published paper. The need for lender of last resort operations will often occur before income falls steeply and before the well-nigh automatic income and financial stabilizing effects of big government come into play. If the institutions responsible for the lender of last resort function stand aside and allow market forces to operate, then the decline in asset values relative to current output prices will be larger than with the intervention, and the decline in income, employment, and profits will be greater. If allowed to gain momentum, the financial crisis and the subsequent debt deflation may for a time overwhelm the income and financial stabilizing capacity of big government. And this is, if you like, more or less a description of exactly what happened uh, in the recent, the recent financial crisis. The third area, which we mentioned in terms of high regulatory approach, we said was in terms of the idea of a cash flow oriented bank examination. And this is what we can classify under the idea of financial supervision. And it was his third major recommendation in terms of in terms of policy. We said the first one is opening the discount window to the entire system. The second is the government taking on responsibility fully for the deposit insurance. And the third was 
the idea of setting up what he called the cash flow oriented bank examination process designed to focus on the actual past and potential near term future position making operations of a bank so that the Federal Reserve authorities could be aware of actual or threatened financial fragility. The perspective is of a dynamic evolving set of financial institutions and relations. All too often it seems as if the Federal Reserve authorities have been surprised by changes in financial practice. Practices. And pretty clearly, we now know that, for example, the financing of subprime mortgages was something that the Federal Reserve really did not, I recognize, and B, did not think was crucially important in the operation of the system. The Federal Reserve needs to guide the evolution of financial institutions by favoring stability enhancing and discouraging instability augmenting institutions and practices. So the idea is that if you're going to be a bank examiner and you have a theory of inherent endogenous financial instability caused by financial distress, that is having to sell position to make position, and you're a regulator, what should you do? Well, obviously you should look at the positions of the financial institutions. You should look at what their cash inflows are, you should look at what their cash outflows are, and you should also, as I said, look at the past and look to the future, okay? Next year, what am I going to have to do in order to fund a position that I've taken lending to a firm on the basis of a five-year contract if I'm funding it with one-year money? Okay. Now, if we look currently what's happening, as I mentioned, there is a, a, a move in this direction. But basically what we've done is to provide stress testing for the banks. Now, stress testing really does not take into account those two vulnerabilities that I mentioned. The vulnerabilities are in terms of the position making. Remember, we talked about those two vulnerabilities. So what I was recommending is a examination process which in fact tries to predict the ways in which financial institutions, number one, are going to be funding their positions and how they're going to be changing those practices. And here pretty clearly, if someone looked at securitization, securitization was a major change in the way these things occurred. In one of the first papers that I wrote on securitization, which dates to 1980, 1981, something like this, he had just come back from the bank structure conference at the Chicago Federal Reserve Bank, and he said, basically what I learned at the conference was that anything that can be securitized will be securitized. Okay, now this is at the point when people thought, well, you can't securitize bank loans. Very quickly, bank loans got securitized. You can't securitize home mortgages. Very quickly, they became securitized. And I recognized that this would have a very, very fundamental impact on the balance sheet positions of banks. So we now talk about this difference between banks having a, uh, a business model of lending and holding assets or lending and selling assets. Well, basically that change was already visible in the 1980s, and so on, and I saw this quite, quite clearly. The last part of the regulatory process that we want to bring up is to look at the objective of policy for the Federal Reserve. I said, first of all. I was very much concerned that the Federal Reserve should be play an active role, as we said, in terms of monitoring the way these financing practices change. But he also believed that the Federal Reserve's operation of monetary policy was a crucial contributor to the transition of the economy from one of financial distress to financial instability, which eventually became the transition of the economy from speculative to Ponzi to Ponzi financing. <laughs> he argued that the use of monetary policy to restrict aggregate demand will lead 
to an economizing of cash balances. <laughs> in place of increased activity being financed in part by increases in the quantity of money, increased activity will be financed almost entirely by substituting debt assets of private units of money in portfolios, or the monetary system may sell government debt to private units and acquire private debt. At every level in the economy, such substitutions imply that each unit is less well able to withstand an interruption in its cash receipts. A given interruption of cash flows, say on income account, will now lead to a larger amount of portfolio changes at all levels in the economy. In short, Fed policy to restrict expansion will encounter resistance in the form of financial innovation, which will largely offset it and create a more unstable financial structure. So he's saying, look, if we now look at the Federal Reserve and its operation of monetary policy in terms of meeting some sort of objectives of price stability or some sort of objectives of the behavior of the real economy, what it's going to end up doing is in fact creating more instability because the operation of monetary policy in terms of restricting the availability of uh, cash in the system will simply lead to an endogenous response by the financial institutions to offset it, and by doing so will create financial inst in innovations which are inherently unstable, and will also leave the Fed, as he suggested before, behind the curve in recognizing the impact of these innovations. So, the result, as high is that the Fed's sole policy objective should be to achieve short-term should sorry the Fed's direct directive to operate to achieve short-term stability of the economy should be replaced by a directive to keep stability in the financial markets and provide money for growth. The day-to-day -day open market operations in the money market should be replaced by easier and wider access to the discount window. Open market operations should be undertaken in order to affect permanent increases in the money supply. So the Federal Reserve should get out of the business of inflation fighting and get out of the business of managing the economy if it wants to support financial stability. In fact, its recommendation was that the Federal Reserve should focus on, uh, let's see where we can skip this. This then led to, in Hyde's view, a complete reversal of the traditional objectives for economic policy. Now again, remember we started out with this idea, what kind of regulation do you need? In order to make recommendations on regulation, we need an underlying theory. That underlying theory has to be one in which financial crisis is an endogenous result of the operation of the system. And then we have to produce regulations which attempt to dampen the financial distress in the system by monitoring position making in the system. And finally, if the Federal Reserve is now going to be looking just at financial stability, we're led to the overall policy objectives in the economy. Here, I then argued an inappropriate financing of investment in capital asset ownership are major destabilizing influences in a capitalist economy. Thus, the substitution of employment for investment as the proximate objective of economic policy is a precondition for financial reforms aimed at decreasing instability. Okay? We should not have a growth objective. We should not have an objective of supporting the rate of investment we should have an objective of creating employment. The emphasis on investment in economic growth rather than on employment policy is a mistake. A full employment economy is bound to expand, whereas an economy that aims at accelerating growth through devices to induce capital-intensive private investment not only may not grow, but may be increasingly inequitable in its income distribution, inefficient in its choices of techniques, and unstable in its overall performance. Okay? If we want financial stability, we also have to change the way we look at overall economic policy. And the point is a, is a very, very simple one. Okay? If you focus on generating employment 
the economy will by definition grow. You don't have to worry about a growth objective. If you maximize employment, the economy will always be growing as long as the labor force continues to grow and as long as there is any technical progress. You don't have to worry. <coughs> the advantage of this is that you avoid the periodic crises of financing and the creation of additional layering and liabilities to fund that particular growth process. So if you look at the idea of the employer of last resort that Randy talked about yesterday, the employer of last resort is really not, and this is why I was so much against this idea of poverty programs, it doesn't have anything to do with poverty. The employer of last resort is a program which provides the support for financial stability. If your policy objective is full employment and you achieve full employment by means of an employer of last resort program, you automatically get growth, you automatically avoid the creation of instability in the financial system, and you do not have the endemic problems of financial instability. So if you look at the way I conceived of the operation of the system, okay, all of these various proposals and all of the various bits and pieces of theory stem from this primary objective of trying to design the kind of regulation and the policies that will produce stability in the system and to avoid, to the extent possible, the endogenous outbreak of crisis. Now, the bottom of this, as everybody has said, I was always a very pessimistic economist from this point of view. Number one, he was pessimistic because he didn't believe these uh, policies would be introduced. But secondly, he was realistic rather than pessimistic. Realistic because he recognized that even if you did introduce these policies, the system would, in fact, continue to be unstable. Why? Because, as I believed, capitalism, and by capitalism he had a sort of a dual definition, there's a political definition and there's also an economic definition. The economic definition is that capitalism is a system in which the ownership or the control of assets has to be funded by the issue of liabilities. Okay, this is what a capitalist system is all about. Why is it unstable? It's unstable because funding position in order to make position will always create cash inflows and cash outflows, which in a system in which the outcome of those investments is uncertain will not always be confirmed you will always be in a position in which, in some cases, the cash inflows will not generate the funds necessary to repay the liabilities. So the system will always be, in a sense, in that sense, an unstable system. Okay? Now, as I've already mentioned, this is a, an attempt to try and incorporate all of these uh, various aspects of High's work within this one sort of overarching or overall, uh, overall framework in terms of identifying the necessity first of having a theory, if you're going to have an explanation of regulation, and then what sorts of policies and what sort of practices you need in order to implement uh, policies that generate financial stability. Okay, I think we managed to keep this down to one hour, so we've got 15 minutes if you want to uh, ask any questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's a, uh, what should I say, it's a, a broad range of things. We put this under the uh, employer of last resort because it fits very nicely together with the idea of lender of last resort. If you think of it this way, uh, if a firm is financing itself by borrowing from a bank, it has to repay the bank. Okay, how does it repay the bank? Well, you can use the Kolesky profit equation and you can say yes, investment perfect. produces the profits that allows the firm to repay the bank, or 
going to say that if the government is running an employer of last resort program, it's the money that you're paying to the labor force that allows the labor force to buy the goods that allows the firm to repay. So it's in, in this sense, it's a, a, uh, a mechanism of financial stability on a par with lender of last resort rather than being a yeah, macro uh, stabilization tool. that are basically repetitive. And I was as much uh, wary of that sort of approach as he was of a steady state approach. It didn't make much difference if the cycles always repeated themselves. Because basically, that meant that you didn't get this endogenous process that we just talked about of the financial institutions responding okay, to the changes in conditions. And this is why we talked about this idea of having a dynamic regulatory approach. The system is always changing. The system is always changing. The cycles are always going to be changing. So that the parameters that you're using in order to generate the cycles have to become endogenous. All right? And this is sort of what I, or Randy was talking about yesterday. When I'd love to, to say this business. The agents in the model have a model of the model. So, the idea was that you, know, you were in the, you were inside the model and you you were in fact tinkering with the parameters as the, as the economy as the economy evolved. So from that particular point of view, he really was was not very interested. On the other hand, he was obsessed with trying to create a more formal representation and certainly spent a good deal of time with people who wanted to do this, despite the fact that he really thought it couldn't be done. And I think the, the, the basic uh, incentive here was he looked upon this as a way to access a wider academic community. Okay? As Randy mentioned, Tom Sargent was, uh, was a student of eyes. They did, uh, what should I say, they did communicate after uh, after uh, Sargent became a, I say, an, econ an economist in his own right, uh, and I did have a, a, an appreciation for his work, although he did not uh, did not agree with it. But the idea was that you know, if I can ever get these people to understand what I'm trying to do, then I'm willing. You know, I'm willing to allow them to do it. It's sort of the the okay, the example I could. The sort of uses that yeah, when when Keynes looks at Hicks's ISLM curve, he said, "Well, you know, this is really terrible, but it makes a point, and the point is an important point. So I'm you know, I'm willing to swallow the little bitty problems because this is something that says that yes, you have to manage aggregate demand in the system. So okay, now I said, yeah, you can you can try and model if by modeling you make the point." that the system is endogenously unstable. So that's, I think, the way I would respond to it. Yeah. Regarding the high level of international flow or the competitive international flow, is it possible to think or to success in a very large international financial system without an international relation? OK, this is, I, I will cop out on this one. I'm going to talk about this day after tomorrow, I think. Something like that. It, the, yeah, the, the point is a very good one. Uh, the idea that Minsky only worked in the on the American economy is not is not correct. Okay, he did spend an inordinate amount of time explaining because this was his financial environment, but he did take into account the interna international 
uh, implications of this. And we'll, uh, I say we'll talk about this the day after tomorrow. So, yeah. Now you mentioned that the Fed made the policy that it should be financial price Okay, the, one of the sections which I skipped, uh, which I can now bring back, is that I was concerned by inflation in the system. The difference was that I was not particularly concerned about inflation as the result of overheating in the economy or the result of uh, excessively high levels of employment. What he was concerned about was the use of lender of last resort or other financial practices to bail out insolvent financial institutions. And his argument was quite simply that when you bail out an institution, when you allow them, well, when you buy the position that they're trying to sell in order to make position, effectively what you're doing is funding a liability which will probably never be capable of generating a cash flow. So what you're doing is creating demand against zero production. And in this sense, becomes very close to a number of Austrian theorists, in which you could talk about this as a case, if you like, of malinvestment. Okay? You financed an investment. The investment goes bankrupt. Why? Because nobody wants to buy this stuff. But you bailed out the firm. Okay? Now, by bailing out the firm, what you've done is to create purchasing power without any supply. And he did worry that this was or would create a potential for inflation. And if you, well, if you, you can look eventually on the website at the, the uh, quotations that I put in, I won't bring them up now. But basically, this is what I said. He said, look, what you're doing is you're validating a position on a private, on a private sector balance sheet. You're creating purchasing power against nothing. This is excess demand in the system. And he did worry very much about that. Now, his response was, well, a, it's bound to occur because you're going to be, in general, bailing out the private sector when it gets into difficulty. But B, the appropriate response is not tight monetary policy. It's not policy to cut down aggregate demand. The policy is to prevent the inappropriate financial innovations that have generated the instability. So if you believe that inflation comes from bailing out insolvent institutions because they have engaged in financial practices that are unstable, the correct response is to shut down those types of financial institutions. So in the current crisis, you're going to say, well, what did we want to do? Well, let's shut down securitization. Now, I don't think that's a good idea, but that's another story. Uh, but this would be the sort of response. It would be, the response would be, well, maybe we don't want to shut down securitization because we've been securitizing mortgages since the 1970s without any problem. What did go wrong is that we allowed securitization to take place in a particular class of mortgages in a particular class of financial institutions. So maybe private label subprime securitizations should be made impossible. And that would, that would be his argument. Because if you, if you sort of you think of it uh, in, in, in that context. Thank you. 
in terms of cash flow examinations, basically, we have, a, um, we have now a system where it is technically possible to track in real time, okay, all transactions in all financial institutions, okay? So it, it can be done. Now what avoiding this would require, okay, it would require going into some sort of deep underground web system in terms of avoiding, okay? Now these are problems of reporting that you have in any kind of system. So it's really not a question of innovation to get around it. It would be a question of avoidance of, com of compliance. Okay. Now, the Fed uh, does have, well, any uh, central bank does have one very effective tool in enforcing compliance, and that is that they can shut down the bank. So if you discover that the bank is not reporting its positions accurately, the bank can be closed. So there's a, a, a very large incentive for banks to, in fact, attempt to you know, meet those sorts of conditions. But as I said, this is not something that would be particular or peculiar okay, to cash flow reporting. It's the same for any sort of reporting, reporting procedures. Okay? Now, the thing which would be important is the way the Federal Reserve, in fact, interprets the data. Okay? Now, we've already mentioned that <clears throat> there was a substantial change in the U.S. in the way the Fed looked upon its, uh, its role in the, in the 1980s. And the example of this took place in terms of the operation of the research department of the Federal Reserve District Bank of New York. At one stage, the Federal Reserve District Bank of New York, its research staff was primarily what we called in the market. Okay? They actively visited and participated and talked to financial institutions. When the deregulatory wave, we'll call it, came in, the research department changed dramatically and it only basically only took, undertook under uh, Frederick Mishkin statistical studies on the impact of shifts in the yield curve on the performance of the economy. Basically, they simply stopped looking at what banks were in fact doing and looked at the price signals coming from the bond market in terms of influencing the shape of the yield curve and trying to use this to predict what the performance of the economy would be. Okay? Now, in that sort of system, obviously, now, having a cash flow examination procedure really doesn't help you very much because if you're not interested in using it appropriately, then you don't get any of the benefits. So one of the reasons why we call this not only uh, examination but also supervision, you have to have people in the Federal Reserve System that are interested in using that sort of data. And I did have a, uh, a proposal for a system of training uh, bank examiners and supervisors so that in fact you could use that, use that information. Now as an aside to this also, uh, Randy mentioned yesterday high preference for small and medium sized banks relative to very large banks. Why? Well, small banks okay, are much easier to examine and supervise than large banks. Okay? The Federal Reserve had over 50 personnel in Citibank before the crisis, and they had absolutely no idea that Citibank was having any problems. So pretty clearly, there is, uh, here is a case of you know, extreme difficulty. Now, the second, the second one, and this will have to be the last one because we're running out of time, this question of price stability. Uh, when we talk more at length um, about the job guarantee and the employer of last resort program, okay? Basically, what you're going to be introduced to is a way in which you can use the uh, AOR labor pool as a means of providing the kind of stability between productivity growth and real wage growth that would provide you with an automatic price stability program. 
so that when you look at uh, the ELR program, the ELR program, as I said before, for Minsky was a program of financial stability. The ELR proposals that have been made by a number of other individuals, in particular uh, Warren Mosler, are that the Employer of Last Resort program is a program of price stability. Okay? And Warren at the University of Kansas City for a long time financed a center which was called the Center for Full Employment and Price Stability. And the argument is that these sorts of programs would allow full employment and price stability to be compatible objectives instead of being competing objectives. Okay? And as I say, since there will be a, a good deal of discussion on these uh, in the coming days, I won't say anything more than that, other than the fact that the idea is that the Employer of Last Resort Program is a basic building block for price stability, and this is what would allow the central bank to concentrate its policy on financial stability rather than on price stability. Okay? We have to take the break. Thank you.